Hello, I'm Robert Trevino, Chief Conductor of the Mamo Symphony Orchestra. We're having a canal conversation, and I have invited Somali, our principal cellist, and also a conductor, a fellow colleague, and I thought it would be nice to speak about this week's concert live on mamolive.se this Thursday. So, Samuli, thanks for joining me. Nice to be here with so, you, Robert. So, we have some music that you know a little bit about, being not only a Finnish person, but also a conductor. Uh, we're I doing think I should, yes. Yeah, we're doing Sibelius' Second Symphony and Rautavara's Lost Landscapes. Mm -hmm. You've played both pieces or only the... Uh, the symphony the, I've played many times, yes, and I think conducted also a couple of times, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, we were talking a little bit earlier about how Sibelius is this composer that, I mean, in Scandinavia, extremely well-known, but he has sort of a very interesting reputation around the world. I mean, for example, if I go to Italy to conduct his music or if I'm in Spain, there's not such a, a history of his music being performed. But if I go to a place like the United States, there's a large history with his mm -hmm. music. And I think that that is important for Rautavara for a conversation about him. But for those who don't know Sibelius so well, I mean, me personally, and I don't know if you agree with this, but I split him up into kind of two composers. The young composer who was very impulsive, very direct, kind of rebellious by nature. You read about um, stories between him and his teachers in Vienna and in Berlin, yeah. and they spoke about him sometimes in sort of very, demean very demeaning ways about, mm -hmm. oh, he's very Nordic in this mm -hmm. very rough way. But then there's the sort of the later Sibelius from the f later the third symphony, for sure the fourth symphony, this hyper metaphysical composer. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there's a big change and difference for how you perform it as not only a, a cellist, but also even as you conduct this music and how you know it? Well, I mean, this was, I guess, one of the first pieces that really got, uh, I mean, he got his, gained his reputation also abroad. And one should remember that Finland, Helsinki, was a little, little town back in those days when everything was written. Symphonies, by the way, they say he started in Italy. So maybe it's a, it's a good country for, for the symphony later on for you to do it. Um, uh, I think the language, for me, Sibelius being a Finn, Finnish composer has still, what is remarkable is that his musical language is not, I wouldn't say typical Finnish, in the way that it uh, talks, it has another kind of a color that, that everybody more or less understands. So I wouldn't consider, I wouldn't say that it's a typical, typical way of playing Sibelius or doing things. It's a, it's, it, he's an international com composer at, after all. I agree with you on this. And it's actually interesting what you say about him not being sort of a, the Finnish in a way that he, his language and, and things work. Because if you read also about his uh, relationships with his teachers and other uh, artists and, and such, they almost all speak about the same thing. Whether he was writing in German with, with Busoni, his friend, or whether he was writing in, uh, in, in, in Finnish, he had a really weird way with language. A lot of typos, a lot of misspellings, but also very weird ways to turn phrases that mm -hmm. were kind of confusing. And everyone said, well, it's kind of Sibelius speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's interesting that you say that because uh, people always like to talk about the mother tongue of a composer being a way that it, it really influences uh, mm -hmm. a composer's way of writing. And you said that this symphony started uh, according to, to to stories in Italy, mm -hmm. which I am inclined to agree with as well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting uh, that it also continued on the seaside in Finland mm -hmm. when he went home. Uh, there was a time when he stopped writing the symphony because he was busy doing other things. But uh, many people said that when he went to his lake house and mm -hmm. he was in contact with the water again, the, that he was able to start composing again. And one f for sure feels that in the very beginning of the symphony. With I these think so, definitely da, da, so. Da, 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 these waves. Definitely so, yes. Yeah, definitely it's fantastic. So. And also that, I mean, he really needed the nature wherever mm. he was, where, whatever he composed. He, he uh, actually moved from Helsing to Ainola, to his villa, mainly because, I mean, still Helsing was a little town, but mainly because it was too noisy. And he really needed, which is easy to understand, but still the nature, the element of nature is, I think, I would say in every, every single note of, of what he wrote. Yeah, absolutely. And you feel also, I think, it, I mean, the first movement, I can't, I, I, when I think about Sibelius symphonies, for sure, I think about the first symphony beginning with that clarinet solo. Mm -hmm. Almost like hearing a lone bird off in the middle of the forest yeah. and this, oh, this yes. very, very isolated landscape. And then the second symphony, these water scenes. And then it isn't quite like that anymore once you get to the third no. symphony. 
And in the fourth symphony, I find in a way, he's really trying to navigate how to to do a formal four movement symphony and not 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 be too traditionalist about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the second movement is is almost completely based off of literary ideas about mm-hmm. a sort of Don Giovanni esque character mm-hmm. getting yes. sent down to hell. Yes, and it's. And, but yet, at the same time, it's something completely unlike anything else that has been written. The scherzo third movement that then goes directly into the last movement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, when I conduct the symphony, and I always come to the ending of it, I mean, it, it, a lot of people say, oh, it's the most glorious and positive ending. Mm-hmm. And yet, I don't actually ever feel that, personally. There's, there's always a sort of, like, weight. There's little sadness in it. Yes, and in, I think the finale in the, in the piece... There's much more to it than just the glorious ending, because obviously, if I mean, easily put, it's easy to hear when it when it's at the end. You know, the chords you cannot be mistaken. But still, I totally agree. There is something more to it, and also, he was an international character and very well informed uh, about the things that were going on, uh, what was happening, the music in the field of music and and literature and all that, meaning that maybe he was o- already ahead of his mind, so to say, already planning the next work, next next style of composing, which is, I think, in Sibelius' case, remarkable. I mean, compare this last symphony or the last pieces of what he wrote when he was young. I mean, that was quite a, quite a trip. Very big trip. Yes. Very big trip. And in fact, you know, it, it's there's a there's an interesting thing, and I, I, I hope that uh, people who, who listen to this concert will will maybe notice this when they hear the ending that yes. the last two chords are this are basically not uh, like what you would hear from a traditional symphony uh, this uh, big dominant chord going back to the tonic it's an amen and yes. this continues to repeat many many times throughout the whole symphony in these tom pi da da di pom la da di ti da di and you have these very characteristic sibelius do 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 or these yeah. chromatic scales that build up and build up and what started off as this m pa pa pi pa pom becomes this storm mm-hmm. but this storm music yeah how he writes it in d major and also these chromatic scales they develop into the in the fifth symphony they become all of these sort of very very chaotic figures that go on in his music and you can really see the development of these rhetorical ideas that he has definitely so so it is i mean all the scales and all the stuff he writes for the orchestra you find the trademarks but i mean how he treats his favorite ones i mean that is it makes a, i think a great composer yeah absolutely fantastic composer yeah. and then we are going to continue the program with rautavara another amazing composer yes in a way, also, uh, considering the Second Symphony of Sibelius was inspired in, in large part by his trip to Italy, mm-hmm. uh, Raul Tavares' Lost Landscapes is in large part inspired by his journeys outside of Finland as well. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a really special occasion for us to be able to perform this piece mm-hmm. because it is the world premiere performance of mm-hmm. the orchestration mm-hmm. of what was originally a piano and violin piece. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Malmo Symphony Orchestra and uh, Simona Lamsman, mm-hmm. we have gotten the exclusive rights over the world premiere performance of it yes. and eventually world premiere recording of it, which we will be doing a little bit later. Mm-hmm. And... Um, this piece is really something quite interesting. Uh, Raul Tavara, I think, for people who don't know his music, I mean, he really went through a lot of different styles in his own musical life. And this being the late Raul Tavara, it becomes a bit more nostalgic in a way, yes. I find. Yes, it is really a journey. I mean, what he had been experien- experiencing throughout his life, I think. So it is actually very heartfelt music. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And, and what, what is also heartfelt is that and 1954, when he went to the States, Rautavara, a lot of money was needed also. So Sibelius was actually the main force uh, in this project. So he made, sh- made sure that there was a scholarship waiting for Rautavara. So he was able to travel and stay there. And this is the so, same way that Sibelius made it yes, to yes. Europe, where he went to Berlin with, with private people giving him money to go because yes. he didn't come from, yes. from, from big money. And yes, and also the trip to Italy when he started writing the Second Symphony, if we go back to Sibelius. So that, w- that was also, I mean, he <laughs> unfortunately was interested in all the sides of life, eating and drinking and all that, and was not very, well, uh, good with the money. So that trip was also financed by, by, by a friend, Axel Carpelan, 
That's right. Who, who actually wrote to him and said that you you have been too much. Too, I mean, you have to spend some time outside in order to to, to compose something. In, in Kapalan's favor, however, when Sibelius came back to, to Finland and he finished the symphony uh, some years later and then gave it to Kapalan, uh, Kapalan said, I feel like I have been more than paid back. Yes. I have, I, I have been dedicated one of the most important symphonies to come out of my country. Definitely ever. Well, well invested money. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. So Rautavara, um, going back to Rautavara, I, a lot of people don't realize that he... he well, first off, I think it, for me, there's an aspect of his life being, I think, an orphan, correct? Yes. Uh, and having this sort of... People who knew him said that he lacked a sort of a sort of stability in the sense that somebody who was born from a very specific home in a very specific class in a specific place, he was a very adaptable person. Mm -hmm. And... Him going to the United States, which couldn't have been probably more radically different than oh, what he had experienced. Like, like a different world. I, I remember reading the, what he wrote about his I mean, time in the US, US was, was like a revelation of something that That's he right. never had seen before. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, and the first movement is all about his time at Tanglewood. Yes. And anybody who's been to Tanglewood, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. It's a very artistic place. I was lucky to be an alumni from, from Tanglewood, and it was transformative in my life. Mm -hmm. And any, I think most any artist who ever went there and, and had the fortune to go really find it to be a remarkable place, an amazing nat natural environment full of extremely talented and very creative people. And in that environment, just very special things happen. And yeah. He said that that was a very, very moving moment for him. You said because of Kuzovitsky uh, in large part. And then also another movement is about uh, uh, Vienna. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then another movement is about his time in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting when you look at uh, Rautavara and experience his, his worldview, there's something... In a way, if you think about a person who doesn't have a stability, who isn't, who is very adaptable, mm -hmm. one feels that this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say transient nature in his music, but rather I would say that it's constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. Even from the first notes of the Lost Landscape, the musical motifs immediately before they are even repeated in the second bar already have have become a different thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just and and as you go through the whole piece, it, it almost doesn't give you the sensation that you have ever heard anything true mm -hmm. one time. You've only just experienced something changing. Yes, yes, yes. And he 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 was fond of I mean describing all kinds of journeys. I mean, this is the first time in his music. He it is about landscapes of journeys or traveling or so. So I I don't know. Maybe he had this longing or this feeling, really strong feeling for for. Maybe something lacking, or just being, being a kind of a person artist who is on the move. That's right. Yes. So in a way, even though everybody is not able to travel so much these days, I think within this one program, you you can experience a lot of different countries, a lot of different cities, a lot of different ideas, and for sure, it's all music that I think is very much like most of us, constantly evolving, constantly changing. Yes. Not static. Totally so. I totally agree. Well, Samuel, thanks for joining me. Thank you. And uh, I hope that you all enjoy the concert. And uh, one day, hopefully soon, I will have you back here at the Mama Live in person to greet you with some amazing music. Thank you. Okay. So, so by the way, was? Robert, do you know why the, the, this was the second symphony was the last piece involving the tuba? Because he didn't brass. like the tuba player. No, the tuba player liked. I mean, may, maybe not, but uh, but he he was very fond of alcohol and apparently a Finnish person is a little fan of alcohol. Unfortunately, and a friend Hello. of Sibelius. Uh, well, up to the point where we're the, up to the point of the premiere, because they say he kind of he was drunk and he destroyed it. All of it, and after the, after the premiere, so he <laughs> said that never ever will I write a note, single note for the tuba. Yes, interesting. Wise man would say so. Yes. <laughs> Who says Finnish people don't have a sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't.